The Pest and Predator podcast is brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm. Welcome to the Pest and Predator podcast, featuring interviews with entomologists from across the prairies. They've got the latest information on pests that you may encounter in your fields and the beneficial insects that help to control them. This podcast is brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Today's guest is Jennifer Otani. She's a pest management biologist with AAFC in Beaver Lodge, Alberta. Jennifer, how are you? I'm doing super well. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for asking me here today. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, So today we're going to talk about praying in the canola canopy. And we know on the Pest and Predator podcast, there's so much happening inside that canopy. Some of it things we're aware of and some of it not so much. We're bringing awareness to that. So with, with so much happening in the canola canopy that we can't see, for example, interactions between pests and predators, what pest are we focusing on today? Okay, so Sean, I am going to take you back in time because this actually stems from a whole, it's actually decades of work that we've kind of been able to fill gaps in through my career. So we're actually going to be focusing on ligus, and that's actually what I was primarily hired initially to actually address in canola. So we're looking at ligus, and so as many people recognize, it's an important pest, feeds on the buds, developing Uh, pods, developing seeds. But uh, what we started to do very early in our career is um, looking at not just the insect populations and not just the ligus instar stages as they developed. We actually also were able to um, gain funding from a a small company you might remember called Wesco. Mm. (laughs) Yeah. So originally we kind of came to them and said, um, you know, we're really interested in starting to look at some of these predators a little more closely, but we do need a bit more resources because this primary project is focused on ligus. So it's um, it's been an evolution over time. We've had different places and people in place to do some work. So that's what I'm talking about today is talking about ligus. And yes, a bit of a play on words in terms of praying in the canola canopy. <laughs> I like it. Okay, so let's talk about the damage that ligus can create inside that canopy. Right. So with ligus, it's such an interesting pest. Um, you know, we're dealing with a species that is primarily native. Depending on your geographic region, it's actually even a complex in our canola canopy. So there can be two to maybe even three species of ligus. But more importantly, what we have is a sucking insect. So, you know, it's focusing on that rapidly developing cell tissues, that meristematic cell tissue. And it really likes to beat on those parts by pushing in its mouth part. It injects a cocktail of enzymes and all of these other good things that help it digest the plant material and then essentially uh, sucks it all back up. Now, that physical and chemical damage actually translates into abortion, abscission, um, seeds ultimately in canola that are all shrunken that, that you will never harvest in a combine bin. So it's pretty, it, it's an interesting insect in that both the adults and especially the later instar nymphs can cause the same type of damage. We're dealing with maybe uh, two or three species, very closely related though, and then we're also dealing with that multi generational aspect um, that can happen in the canola canopy depending on which part of the provinces or the prairies you're in. So is that, is that sucking that the ligus bug does? Is that sort of similar to the irritation that like a mosquito would have on a human? It, maybe not the best comparison, but is it sort of kind of like that? Like, is, is it just, is it uh, setting the plant back? Like, or what is it doing to the plant that it's, it's such a terror on it? Yeah, so that's an interesting analogy that you drew upon with mosquitoes. In some ways, there's some comparison, but it's a, it's a little more specific to that plant-insect interaction. So it's it's the physical damage, but it's also that cocktail of enzymes and such that it will actually inject that help it break down that plant tissue and then pull it back up. So, uh, you know, in many ways, your analogy with the mosquito is not far off but very specific to the plant material. And of course, what's really important is that they're usually focused on these rapidly developing points on the canola plant 
or any plant, because of course, ligas have this tremendously broad host range. They can feed on almost any plant that has a bud. But it's that that damage to the rapidly developing cells, which also physically causes, I mean, there's stunting there. And then a lot of physiological hormonal things are happening just with that cocktail. So it's an interesting interaction. It's so fascinating to me that Ligus is so able to bridge and feed on such a diverse number of plant species too. You know, it's a, it's a hard insect to manage because of that. You know, it's not like it's dedicated to this one plant at this one time of year. And then you can, you you know, you can almost target something like that a little bit better. But with Ligas, it's totally different. It, uh, it is a it is a wide spectrum of diet. <laughs> it, it, yeah, exactly. And you know the movement in and out of some of our field crops. Of course, uh, you know there's been a lot of work done with that. Uh, but part of the problem is when you have an insect group that is so diverse, it's multi generational. You know you can be dealing with two, maybe even in parts of southern Ontario, you can deal with up to four generations per year. Oh, wow. Like that is super hard to manage because. They're able to move around and make use of a lot of different areas. So let's talk about the natural enemies. What what natural enemies prey on the Ligus bug? So it's the the really fascinating part of this work is that initially when we were looking at some of our Ligus populations, this is based on a lot of our field plot work that we did right in Beaver Lodge. So this is in the Peace River region up north in Alberta. Uh, what we were looking at initially is trying to actually say answer the question, which predators are there? What seems to be associated with Ligus populations that seem to be higher? And can we maybe even start to figure out who is associated with Ligus specifically? And of course, the um, this is relying on sweep net monitoring on a weekly basis. And what we found is that there were actually not so much specific predators, but what we found were actually a fairly large group of general predators. And this isn't uncommon. But what was really interesting to us is that we didn't necessarily have outbreaking populations of ligus. And yet we had these general predators in there and they had to be feeding on something. And really ligus was the only pest species or anything of any density that we could find in the canola sweeps. So we started to actually focus down on those predators that we would find consistently over about three years of field research. And so uh, what everyone knows ladybird beetles, and sure enough, we found those in the plots. Uh, another group that we would find fairly consistently, but not in great numbers, would be lace wings. And particularly, it was actually the larvae at certain periods, synchronized actually quite nicely with when the ligus nymphs were starting to appear. Similarly, with the ladybird beetle larvae, we would find those in some slightly higher numbers, but again, fairly well synchronized with when the ligus nymphs were starting to appear. The other groups that we were really seeing fairly consistently were damselbugs. In our situation, we felt that we had two species of damselbugs. Interestingly, we had a long and a short wing morph of Navis rosa penis damsel bug but then we also were finding some crab spiders so you know at this very early point you have to remember this is like the early 2000s we were looking at these groups and saying okay we're finding them they seem to be well synchronized with our one pest which is ligus there's nothing else really in there they have to be feeding on something however they are general predators so we kind of had to leave that for a number of years, and it wasn't until we had a really talented co-op student come into our lab in 2011. And this person was very interested in doing a specific project. And I said to her, okay, here's what we've been noticing. We've seen this pretty consistently. We've got data from the early 2000s. What about looking at some of these predators? We've got a short list from the field plot data that we've collected over these initial first three or four years we think that these need to be looked at a little closer. And so Leticia was super awesome. She actually organized a really nice study. We did it in the lab, which again, very artificial, but at least it was giving us some indication of what would happen if we put a predator with some of these ligus nips. What would happen if we left it overnight? I mean, the assumption is that there's hopefully gonna be some predation, but we really wanted to answer that question. Will these predators actually feed on ligus nymphs? Because we could see the synchrony between some of them and the appearance of the ligus nymphs. So that's exactly what we did in petri dishes. 
So field collected individuals were brought in, Leticia, and then we had some people in our lab helping her. Uh, we were isolating individuals so that the predators were set up. So there was one predator in a Petri dish with 15 ligus nymphs. And we really focused on third, fourth, and fifth instar ligus nymphs, which are the big ones, okay? And I, I don't want to sound lazy, but they definitely are bigger to handle when they're, <laughs> or they're easier to handle when they're bigger, I should say. Uh, but that's also the stage that we are starting to think that they probably were a decent prey item. And that's something that general predators are probably functioning on. You know, do you eat a whole bunch of little prey? Well, that can be a lot of work. Or do they focus on larger prey? And maybe that's less work, but then they're harder to handle. Those sorts of things. But essentially, we set them up in a Petri dish. And what Letitia was able to look at was pretty surprising to us. So the first thing we answered, like all of these predators actually did consume ligus nymphs. So they're a real factor in a canola canopy. It's not just us saying, oh, we're pretty sure we think this is happening. But in the Petri dishes, even though it's artificial, some of them were eating, you know, two or three over a 24 hour period. At most, we had seven ligus nymphs consumed by a predator. So these are not small numbers, you know, and over a 24 hour period, we thought that was pretty respectable for something that's really only about three, maybe six millimeters long. So then we kind of asked the next question, and it's, um, it's pretty important because we wanted to answer, do these predators maybe have preferences? And the ultimate aim here in my mind at that point was, we want to know if they have preferences because are they actually maybe filling a certain niche for a predator? Because we always talk about general predators and predators in general as being, I like to talk about them as being insurance policies. You know, having something there that will have the ability to prey on your pest population is really important. You actually have to have a few pests to have those predators in place. However, we wanted to answer that question a little more specifically. And it was so surprising. So first of all, you know, when I talked about putting these predators in a dish, we actually only gave them third instar nymphs sometimes, or we only gave them fourth instar nymphs, or we only gave them fifth instar. So you can see we gave them no choice. What was surprising to me is that some of those predators ate more of certain instars. But even more importantly, some of those predators were not really as voracious as we anticipated. The real surprise to me was the seven-spotted ladybird beetle. Now, you might recognize that one, Sean, because it's actually, um, it's an introduced species to North America. It was one of the, uh, you know, first biocontrol agents. However, it's also spread over North America and is, in fact, displacing some of our native ladybird beetles. So, you know, I anticipated that, oh, wow, if they're in the canola canopy, they're probably going to have quite an impact. But the interesting thing is they really didn't eat that much for nymphs. They were, in fact, one of the lower, um, they consumed some of the fewest number of nymphs. They still ate them, but they weren't our big, huge consumer. What was really interesting is that these damsel bugs, though, they actually were consuming anywhere from five, maybe even seven nymphs over a 24-hour period. So damsel bugs are really interesting, too, because they're also a sucking insect. However, they're predaceous, so they have to consume other insects to survive. They're super cool. We find them in the canola canopy. And what we were seeing is they actually seem to really enjoy eating the ligus nymphs. Granted, we gave them no choice, but they, they really like to eat them. And then, of course, that's where it comes into the preference trial. So we gave a single predator a choice of third, fourth, or fifth instar nymphs. We actually gave them five of those different instars. So there was a same total of 15 nymphs in the Petri dish. And again, it was actually very surprising to me. So our ladybird beetles, the seven spot, which is an introduced species, again, it didn't really care what instar stage. They didn't eat that many, but they did eat ligus nymphs. So that was good to know. We also tested a native species, which we were pretty sure is Coccinella trifasciata, or the three-banded ladybird beetle. Uh, I particularly like these native species because, as I said before, some of them are getting displaced by the C7 or this um, seven spot. The seven or the three-banded ladybird beetle, it was also, it ate more than the seven spotted ladybird beetle, but again, not really a preference. So it would eat anything from a third to a fifth in sardine. But when we got to the damsel bugs, 
both the two species that we're pretty sure we were testing in there, interestingly enough, they actually preferred to eat fourth and fifth instar nymphs. So they actually preferred to eat larger nymphs. Likewise, the crab spider that we tested, um, and these we don't have species for the crab spiders. It was strictly what we collected from the canola canopy. They similarly also like to eat larger instar nymphs. So what it was showing to us is that each of these predators, they do have preferences. First of all, they all ate ligus nymphs, which is the good news story. But I think what was really interesting to me is that we had something that was almost demonstrating specialization for larger, larger ligus nymphs. It's hard to say really quickly five times. <laughs> um, but then we also had the ladybird beetles, which seemed to really not care and would consume anything. They wouldn't eat a whole ton of them, but they have this ability to feed on whatever kind of came their way. The other thing is I do want to mention, we did, Letitia was able to set up lacewing larvae and the ladybird beetle larvae. And it was really interesting there too, because they were some of the most voracious in terms of the consumption, whether we gave them any instar stage. So, you know, these larvae uh, were even more valuable, if you will, to a grower because this work, even though it was done in the, it was done in petri dishes, it gives us some indication of what the impact some of these predators might have. It suggests to us that they are playing a very important role when it comes to ligus, but it also indicates to us that you actually need all of them, because if some of them are more specialized on certain instars, well, you still need some of that background predation to control the younger or the smaller nymphs that are starting to develop too. So it really demonstrated to us that all of those predators had a role to play and they were obviously in there and they fed on ligus nymphs. So a really good news story. Now, I should also just add, you know, we've been following up on some of this data with our annual canola survey that we do in the piece. This has been happening since 2003. And so we've been trying to look at not just the ligus and the instar stages, but also during that one time we're in that field, we're also looking at some of the other uh, natural enemies, some of the pollinators that are in there, and really trying to get a better sense of what's overlapping with our pest population. And for the most part, the canola that we're surveying at that time really is just our main pest is ligus. You know, by that early stage, when we're talking about that early flower stage, we're not dealing with Bertha. We usually don't have grasshoppers. Um, so it's given us a good opportunity to look at what's in that canola canopy. And sure enough, we're still seeing damselbugs. We still see the ladybird beetles. Um, and we're very happy to see some of those crab spiders. But again, it's just following up. And we're actually hoping to do more with that survey data to kind of elaborate on how many species are in there. Because even though we focused on just a handful of general predators, Sean, in this lab study that was done quite a long time ago, uh, you know, when we are dealing with our canola canopy, there's almost 140 taxon units, and that's everything from species to genus level. And some of those things are still at family level because we're still not able to identify further. So when you think about 140 potentially species in your canola canopy, it's actually quite a revelation to me. And again, you know, one of the great things from this survey data and any of this monitoring data that we're able to do it's really important that we emphasize that a small proportion of what's in that canola canopy for insects is actually a pest. By and large, the bulk of it is all of these other species, some of which we still don't really know what their role is. Fascinating stuff. So Jennifer, there's a lot happening there as you described it so well. These natural enemies are working extremely hard in the canopy they are, you know, we talk a lot about beneficial insects. They, they're they working for you for free. The question mm -hmm. always is, though, is there a way that growers can support them, you know, enhance their activity, uh, protect them? Uh, what, what are some of the things we got to keep in mind? Yeah, so that is always a really important question to ask because I think growers sometimes, I feel like sometimes they might have this sense of being uh, powerless. And in this case, there's actually a few key things that they can do. You know, just looking at their overall crop rotations, just the fundamentals of the agronomy to produce a crop, in so many ways that actually contributes to overall health of a stand. 
And it actually gets you to a point where you have a competitive stand that can withstand some pest pressure, whether it's insect, weeds, or diseases. Now, of course, we're talking about actually reaping the benefits of having some of these natural enemies. So there are certain things absolutely that growers can do. One thing is to really, really focus on your monitoring and start to actually implement control only when you need to. That means actually doing the scouting and actually applying economic thresholds to your management strategies. Spraying insecticides too early or without knowing what's in your crop is really going to have a detrimental effect on these natural enemies, these predators that are already out there. You know, I want to remind you that some of these species that we looked at, whether it was the ladybird beetles, um, some of these damsel bugs do have two generations per year. Uh, but many of them is a one generation per year reproduction cycle. So interrupting that life cycle means that they're gone for the rest of the year. And of course, they're not going to reproduce. So just that mindset of scouting, using your thresholds, you know, being uh, carefully managing whatever control you have to use. Those are some very important steps. You know, some other areas, too, is we know that some of these predators are not necessarily overwintering in the field. So, you know, we talk about field margins and the importance of them. You know, where I am, we see a lot of these margins actually being pulled out because they're trying to optimize all of their cropping land. The only thing I would say to you is that, you know, remember that some of those marginal areas actually are acting as a reservoir. They're acting as a point from which some of these predators need to go out and overwinter and from which they move back into your field. So, you know, I, I think we want to really emphasize how growers are looking at some of those field margins and perhaps be rethinking their value. You know, I've also had growers tell me that, you know, taking some of those field margins or those low areas out, you know, in the end, it, yes, you can plant more, but sometimes those areas were also left to grow trees because they are the low spots. They're the hardest parts of the field to manage. They collect water. Well, some of those areas might actually be of more value than you might realize. So perhaps being really gung-ho to take them out or to farm them, that may not prove to be as valuable. Now, I'm not saying that you want to preserve your damsel bugs rather than plant canola. I would never venture that far. But I do want to remind people that those margins actually can play a really significant role. The other thing I should just mention, Sean, too, you know, some of the work that we've done with wheat midge and the parasitoid macroglenes penetrans, we know that rotating and adjacent fields, those can play really important roles to what happens in that present specific field that you're trying to manage. So it's actually more about managing an area rather than field by field. But then too, it's also really important that the scouting happens in each field because that variation with your pests as well as some of these beneficials can definitely exist. So there are a number of things that I think growers can do and I think being careful and cautious and really being aware of what's in your fields is so much help. So if they have that capacity to do that, I would really strongly encourage them. Jennifer, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for being a guest this week on the Pest and Predator podcast. And we'll chat again soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Sean. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Pest and Predator podcast. It's brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm.